How's everybody? Good. 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 First of all, first and foremost, thank you so much for coming out uh, to what we believe is going to be a very, very important meeting uh, for the future of, of minority physicians and students and, and everything else as we present uh, this membership meeting and hopefully in what you see, you will say, I want to be a part of, uh, which is very, very important to us. Over the last year, physicians, what you have done for us in the community it is amazing. And I want to say thank you personally and from Tryon Solutions say thank you uh, because it, it has not been easy for many with COVID, but when I say front line, you guys are on the front line. And so we thank you for everything that you've done for the community. Uh, additionally, I personally want to thank you because Reggie and I had a conversation a few weeks ago. My daughter is actually going to PA school. And when I asked her why, we were driving down the street one day, and I said, why do you want to go to PA school? And she said, I'm not sure. And I said, well, until you know, we don't need to talk any further. So a couple months later, she came up to me, and she said, Dad, I, I realized that my entire life, I've not had a black physician. And I looked at her, and I said, really? And she said, that's my why. She said, because I want anybody who I treat to be able to look and say, maybe I can too. So I had the opportunity to tell her about what you guys are doing this morning, and that was again an inspiration to a 22-year-old young lady who is now you know, working her tail off to be able to be in the same seats as you. So again, I thank you for what you are doing for the African-American community, what you're doing here in Michigan. Uh, as I told Reggie, Anything you guys need that we can help you, support you, and continue to spread the message of the positive change and, and the way that you're moving forward, we here want to do that. Uh, as most of you know, um, Tony Williams, one of the founding members of uh, PEC. What PEC is, Physician Equity Coalition for Healthcare Disparity. And so we want to thank you for attending today. We're going to start off, just a quick fact, just two reports. <clears throat> the National Academy of Medicine in 2005 looked at a study of uh, the health, the social health of African American in the United States. And they said black people died uh, at a higher rate than white, uh, African American are sicker than white in order to receive more quality of health care uh, versus white. We're more likely to die from cancers and heart disease and diabetes. And just it also an interesting note, just in the American Medical uh, Association produced a paper in November of 2020. And what they did, they looked at the status, uh, the health status of African American in the United States, and they had a physician paper. So the American AMA recognized that racism negatively impacts and exacerbates healthcare inequities among historically marginalized communities. Uh, and their conclusion was, specifically, they wanted to develop a new policy that recognized racism in its systemic, culture, interpersonal, and other form as a serious health threat. You know, that's very powerful. We should have we should have, as African Americans, have come to that conclusion. But someone else has came, come, came to that conclusion for us. The second thing what I want to do is guide us through what guide us through what the physician equity coalition is about. The physician equity coalition is a collaboration of black physicians with the purpose to focus on initiatives to improve overall health and well-being of the community, of Detroit community. This is to improve health outcome, health disparity, and health inequities associated with the residents in the city of Detroit. The COVID-19 pandemic has blatantly and shamefully exposed how long history of racial discrimination and institutionalized race-based policy in the United States have uniquely tied African Americans to the bottom of the U.S. economic and class hierarchy, which is driving our poor health outcome. PEC aim is to address these health care concerns. So I'm often asked, what is PEC about? 
and I'm often asked, how does PC relate to the DMS and the National Medical Association? PC main focus is to focus on the health of African American in the city of Detroit. It's about bringing, uh, bringing local black physicians together to improve the well-being of the community we serve. It's not a national organization or a statewide organization. It is not to replace, supplant, or compete with any organization such as a historical National Medical, National Medical uh, Association or the Detroit Medical Society, which has performed admirably in the function throughout the years. Our effort is to be one of collaboration. PC focus is on improving the overall health of the Detroit community, eliminating and, he and addressing health care disparity, health inequity, and poor health outcomes. I look forward to PEC collaborating with Detroit Medical Society and the National Medical Association. So, what is PEC? PEC was established as a 501c3 in 2020 as advocators of compulsory, uh, compulsory health insurance and health care to promote the interests of African American physicians to committed to improving the quality among people of color, to be a community health educator and political advocator, and to push our own clinical research uh, with diseases that affect our community the most. We also uh, will be engaged and partner with local, state, private agency to eliminate health care disparities. What, what is PEC mission? PUC mission statement is such. Our mission is to strive to be the uh, connection for regional and national transformative vanguard to eradicate health disparity and health care inequity. How do we propose to do that? With four initiatives. PC plan, PC have developed pipeline or stem cell program to increase or risk the number of African American physicians. We have an advocacy arm. We advocate for physicians at different hospitals. We have a clinical research arm. Uh, we're going to talk about more today. Uh, today. We're going to look at the diseases that affect our community the most, and that's what we're going to tackle. We're going to take the lead on and, and, and produce the clinical research so we can implement in our community so we can get better outcomes. And PC, we have a community uh, outreach program. So PEC asks of you today, we ask that you share our vision, share our vision to strive to inspirationally advocate and promote and improve the lifelong health of individuals, to, to promote and regenerate hope and transform this underserved community, to promote diversity and cultural competency. We need physicians that look like us, to communicate like us, so we can better communicate with our patients so they can have a better understanding of their, uh, of their health, to help eradicate health care disparity. How do we propose to do this? We propose to do this with community connection and engagement. We have an eight-step plan. We want to increase the number of African-American physicians through a stem cell pipeline program. We want to be innovative. We want to develop a team of visionary, dedicated leaders like yourself. That's why you're here today. We want to explore and identify health care inequities and identify the community needs. We want to engage and partner with, uh, partner and, and address, we want to engage with other groups that want to address health care disparity. We want to develop cutting edge, uh, cutting edge clinical, uh, clinical, clinical information that reduce disparity. We want to develop, we want all our clinics to communicate and have a virtual wall so we can do better patient care uh, integrity. We want to ensure clinical base and research driven best practice and improve and address social determinants. So, in 1966, Martin Luther King was addressing uh, a medical conference about the inequities in the African American community. 
And he said at that time, of all form of inequities, injustice in health care is the most, most shocking and most humane and inhumane. Well, we were called you here today. We want you to let your voice be heard. We want your voice to become part of the conversation when we start addressing health care disparity. When they're talking about health care disparity in Blue Cross Blue Shield, a PEC member should be there. When they talk about health care disparity in the state house, PEC should be there. Anytime they talk about health care or poor outcome about our people, one of our members should be there. So we, we ask you to join us and just be, become part of the conversation. Let your voice, let your voice be heard. We ask you to be the leaders that we know that we are and start leading, leading towards better outcome for our patients. So how do we propose to do this? Well, how do you join? We want you to join. We, we, have, we have applications at the back. Now you can join and be a member, but you don't necessarily have to be on the committee. We just want your support. We have several different committees that you can join, something you may find yourself interested in. Our annual fee is $100 a year, and we have credit cards. We accept credit cards today or checks. In terms of general meeting, general meetings, we'll have four general meetings a year. We'll be meeting every, uh, meeting every quarter. Um, if you need more information, you can contact either me or one of the board members. we give you some additional information. If we hadn't said anything that we need to say today or there's something that we should have addressed, we can all, you can always give us a call. In about 30 days, we'll be doing all this communication on the website that we have going active and all this information. We have the application on there. We have a committee that you want to join. We have upcoming and scheduled meetings. We have our board member, Jim Bridges. He's going to come and talk to you about the pipeline program where we're going to try to increase the number of positions in our community. Uh, I'm excited, like uh, Reggie and Tony, for an opportunity to present to you uh, some work that's been underway for a good period of time. I joined after the group started, but have had fun working with the, and through the process of building something that's very important. And really, the first part of the work that needs to be done relative to pipelines really has been done, and been done very well, both by Tony in terms of the data and history of healthcare for black folks in this community is not news to any of us. The, what's news for you today, I hope, and that you will act on, is that you will hear something that will engage some part of you that will motivate you to join us in various ways, all of which have been laid out by Tony. I'm going to talk about one in a little bit of detail as well as Dr. Eaton as, as well as we talk about the pipeline. Pipeline activity I don't think is unique to any of you, so I will walk through it with what I believe is our view of what needs to be done that is unique to PEC and black folks in the Detroit area. I grew up in the Detroit area, I'm a physician who went to school around here, I'll say more about that later, especially as it relates to some very special thoughts that I have about young black people, uh, the academic path, and medicine. Because that's because this is not about a generic program for kids, this is not a good or bad state, this is not, at, at our beginning, this is not about country day students. This is about our, our C and B students and what we can do for them to make sure that they can sit in your seats in the future. So that, as by way of background, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the slides, and I think I'm actually going to try and use. Uh, no, I just got that pointer. To, yeah, pointer. I usually like to use the keyboard, but let's see if we get my slide to keep up here. Uh, so the first thing is, is a, a bit of a frame for what we're covering today, and so I'm going to. There's some complexity to it, but it's a very simple idea, and the first part of it has been laid out in enough detail. Why do we need to do? So I, I'm assuming that at this point, that is very clear. And for most of you, because you're part of the choir, you're already here, you already know that that's important. And that's why you're here already. So I, I won't elaborate on that. But what I do want to explain are the four pieces, the three pieces, uh, four, the three, four pieces underneath this. Because uh, at a very high level, I'm going to walk you through what, we're, what, what pipeline means for us. And then there'll be some detail that we'll go through and very quickly in the slides. And it's not intended to 
convey everything that you need to know nor everything we're about to do, but hopefully enough to whet your appetite. So as uh, Tony mentioned, as more information develops and as we have subsequent meetings, we hope if you have some interest in join us in building this out. So the, the, the first thing here is again, I, I mentioned unique to our students. Uh, our students need to see people in front of them who do what you do because many of them have no concept of that, right? They see the other kind of folks in front of them every day. So that's the first step is exposure. Next is a range of options. So not only do a lot of our young people not see us or know how many of us there are doing really grand things like you are, they have little concept of, you know, maybe a pediatrician and maybe a general surgeon if they have a hernia. Yeah, but they don't know about the, you know, the dozens of other specialties and opportunities that exist in healthcare for physicians, physician assistants, and not part of our initial phase of activity, but also enlightening them that for IT, accounting, actuarial, marketing, there are a range of very good positions equal to other disciplines within healthcare. We want to make sure that they come to understand those as well. But it will start with a focus on medical specialties and allied health. Uh, the second part of it is, is again, so there's a theme here, we're sort of building out how to engage young people to not just hear and understand it, but to the to the uh, latter, the latter part, point, the second, third point here uh, in the sequence is personal focus. So you're interested in healthcare, you learn a little about what the career opportunities are, do you understand how to get there? So what do you need to know, what do you need to be doing, what is your path that is broader than just in academics, and I'll show you that on the next slide. What do you need to be doing in junior high school, in high school, entry to undergrad, getting out of undergrad, doing things in undergrad that heighten the probability, if not the certainty, that you'll be admitted to medical school, you will complete medical school. And for the last point, and this is what Dr. Eden may will talk about a little bit later, when you finish medical school, how are you going to do during residency? You finish your residency. You get your first or initial physician, uh, position as a physician in an organization. You start your own, bit, you, your own group, etc. You're an individual practitioner. How do you get that to the next level? Should you aspire to some administrative <coughs> position in your own organization that you build or in other large organizations, like I worked for a fair amount of time in here for a health system. I did things there in terms of senior level if you want to do that, what's the path? You know, what do you need to be doing in this, those, those steps that precede that, that allow enable you to do that? And so this is where I come back to the uh, CN, CN, CNB black students. So I ended up with a very successful career at Henry Ford and at Blue Cross. And I went to, and went to medical school at, at, at Michigan. What people don't know about me, I don't even think I've told this with the, the PEC group, but other folks know this already. I grew up in Detroit. I'm Polish. I really grew up in Hamtramck. I think I assume everybody understood I was Polish when I walked up, right? <laughs> yeah, I grew up in Hamtramck. Uh, but the key thing is, um, and, and why I'm so enthused about this, and why I would like you to be very enthused about this, is I was a very, very, actually below average kid in school. So I graduated from Mumford High School with a 1.7. You hear me? On 1.7. So there's a story that was mine of young black people who are written off, for which the chapter is not finished. The book is not finished. So we have to believe and, sh and move our feet to help young people like I was to be where you are today. So that's what this is about. And this is part of what I meant when I said the way in which our efforts uh, have and will be designed are for our kids. Okay, so that's that's uh, that's what sort of walks through it, the, the uh, sequence of things we need to go through. So I'm going to move pretty quickly here because I've sort of laid out the specifics of it as well as the theme and the principles and the values that are unique to this being PEC, which is really targeted uh, at Black health through black people. Just made that up to me. That might be something put on the website. So, good. <laughs> <laughs> so at, at any rate, uh, so I, I mentioned uh, already this broad understanding. So 
the path that I described to a high level administrative success at, 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 at its pinnacle, it's, it's, not, it's not just about getting good grades, right? It's all these other aspects about your philosophy, a sense of potential, making good choices, disciplining who your peer group is, uh, it, it is the cost of getting in and through the entire educational path is insurmountable, is it, is it possible? These are all these things that many of us have learned. These kids here, if they're living uh, life through sound bites, it sounds impossible, right? Well, it is, it's not impossible. It's very doable, but who tells them? So the other part of my personal story that I relate to, which is why I've been energized about this all my life, I have, as is mentioned down here on one of the points about much, multiple years of experience, I've been uh, in one form or another doing uh, mentoring in a Detroit community for over 50 years. So one of the things that I always tell the kids, so my father was from Mississippi with a sixth grade education. He taught me some values and the value of education, but he couldn't teach me how to, how to, how to act in boardroom or at a hundred dollar plate restaurant or at a cocktail party at a $20,000, $50,000 a year membership country club. Okay, that's where business is. That's where that's relationship works. Our kids don't know that. They need us to transfer that, transfer that information to them. Uh, partnership has been mentioned. I mentioned the sensitivity to culture and economic priorities. That's just what I've been talking about in terms of some of my own personal experience. And uh, we have a work group that has been started, uh, sub, uh, a committee of PEC that's focused on pipeline. We have already selected, through Reggie's help in particular, uh, eCourse as our initial school. And I'll tell you about the model. And I'll be, move that fairly quickly, and then I'll, I'll be finished. And uh, Dr. Eaton will come up and talk about uh, some of the early thoughts we have about the uh, success and supports uh, past medical school, and actually in medical school as well. Um, so we have an initial model. It, 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 it'll vary, but I'll get into that later or some at subsequent meetings. So I'm going to go through this very quickly because this is the detail for those of you that are interested about how we're going to actually interact with young people. Uh, I, I would very quickly add uh, at the joint, uh, through joint discussions that we've already had with in, individuals that meet these schools. So Reggie arranged a meeting for us with uh, the principals of the junior high, high school, and the superintendent for the school system. So that's what we are to how we have laid this out, you know, always subject to improvement. We will start with eighth and ninth graders. I won't go through the detail here. It's about a sense of exposure and possibility and detail, sort of tantalizing them about possibilities that exist for them. A lot of detail. You can read the slides. I do have the handouts. If, if you have a question subsequently, let me know. Uh, the next step is for kid, and, and that step will be taken very broadly with all kids in the school system. For the kids that raise their hand, they say, I'm interested in healthcare. Uh, well, okay, then we go deeper into what are the options that exist within healthcare that are both clinical and, and non clinical. That would be the second step by giving that exposure. And then, likewise, for the kids that continue to raise their hand, say, Yes, I heard something, I didn't know, this is what I think I'd like to do, this is where we get into this uh, broader exposure to what you saw on the earlier slide. It's just is the academics plus all the other information that we would begin to lay out over uh, a, a 12 to 24 months to have them understand, as I described, it's a long view of life process. When you decide to be a physician at whatever age you start, I didn't decide until I was in junior college, uh, which of course is where I had to go with my grades, right? But, but it got me through, right? And so it, it works out. It works out. And so, but. The process of growing your career so that, as I like to say, other folks, young folks today end up in your chair, you're constantly working on your career. You're not finished with your career when you, when you finish uh, medical school. You've got a lot of additional work that, that Dr. Meaton is going to talk about in a moment that needs to be done. We need to tell them about that now so it doesn't hit them as something new or, or even worse. They're never told. And as a consequence, they come out with very good grades, very bright, but they don't have a clue about how to work in the larger world. And, and dare I say, not only work in the larger world, but actually create and sustain and enhance and improve success behaviors and attitudes and skills that take them to the top level, should that be their intention. All right, so that's it. 
Uh, so I, uh, uh, as you can tell, I'm ready. Okay, I'm ready. So the question is, are you ready? I hope you will answer likewise. And so there's a lot more to cover. Uh, we will take questions later. I'm going to ask Dr. Ina if you want to come up now, and she will tell you a little bit more about that uh, post high school process, of which there are many pieces. We aren't as far along there, but she'll, she'll let you know. Thank you, Thank you Jim. I would love to see a physician population that's representative of the patients that we treat. So that being said, I think it's going to be important, I think, for us to keep developing networking and collection and, and collaborations. And within PEC, we develop a network of physicians where we're supporting um, students, whether it's medical students, undergrad. But then when we come out, we're supporting them as residents and making sure that they know that we're here and we're providing with tools for success, tips, providing them with research opportunities, connections, connecting amongst, connect, connecting them with us, but also connecting them with individuals at different levels, whether that's connecting residents back to undergraduates or connecting attendings back to medical students, and certainly trying to develop a pipeline where we are supporting African Americans who want to develop careers in leadership in medicine. So that's kind of my bigger picture look, and I just wanted to share that with you again. Thanks for coming out today. It's nice to see you all here. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Real Time really appreciates Tony to inviting us uh, to partner with you all in this uh, venture. Uh, Tony has a mindset about uh, bringing us on to monitor his hypertensive patients for something that uh, PEC will be doing along the line. Uh, we are, as uh, the gentleman from Tryon stated, we are 100% minority owned. Main owner right there, Michael Evans. Uh, How you doing, Mike? Um, and we are looking forward to servicing patients throughout mainly uh, Michigan, but we are nationwide. This program that we provide, and I'll be here to talk, I want to keep it short so you can have a break, but we'll be here to talk to you about it. We can provide your patients uh, as the old school way is you tell them to go to the pharmacy, get a blood pressure cuff, and they log in and bring you their results. With us now in 2019, uh, Medicare bought out these billing codes. So uh, I'm going to go back because this is my first time in 20 some odd years where I actually, actually can tell the physician, you can get something out of this. You know, it's always been about the patients. So we have the oh, Medicare is making so you can bill for the services that we provide. Okay, so now you can get something. I can look at you and say, hey, you can get something out of this doc. You don't have to twist my arm anymore, we got you. So uh, you, we will provide your patients with uh, blood pressure cups. We'll set your office up with a portal where you will receive the results within three to five minutes of that patient uh, doing the blood pressures. And we can oversee that for you according to the parameters that you set, okay? We have a clinical staff that'll do that. Uh, docs, typically I'll give you, I, you know, I like to keep it short, doctors ask, what do I have to do? The only thing you have to do is two things. When your patient falls into the critical ranges that you provide, be it I use 165 over 90, when that happens, you take over Ms. Jones. When Ms. Jones gets back into the normal parameters, we'll provide the service again. Uh, and then you bill. So those are the two things only that you do. We can do everything else. Now if you want to provide the full service, you can do so. All right, so we'll be here to talk to you more about it. Michael Evans and myself, here. thank you so much. We're gonna start off looking at the population of African American in, in, in Wayne County, which is 38.7% uh, 30, uh, and Detroit is 78.3%. Uh, in Michigan is 14.1 percent. We want to start off with the top five diseases that affect African Americans. Uh, diseases of the heart, cardiovascular disease, malignancy, I mentioned earlier today that blacks die from a high rate for malignancy, accident, and cardiovascular disease. We die at a, a significantly higher rate. Our rate is significantly higher when we compare to uh, non-blacks. This is just another chart looking at age-adjusted 
uh, mortality rate. And you can see African American lead in every area except uh, chronic uh, lung disease and Alzheimer. Probably the reason we don't lead in Alzheimer because we die a lot early before Alzheimer set in. Uh, so the initial diseases that PC has decided to adopt and focus on are is colorectal cancer and adolescent hypertension for the following reason. One, it's affordable. Uh, two, the, is the easy uh, the ability to achieve goals and demonstrate changes is very simple. So in terms of colorectal cancer, we, a lot of us, I'm not going to dumb it down, a lot of us seen this chart, we know the mortality rate is higher, the death rate is higher in colorectal cancer in both males and females. Uh, with this chart, look at the age adjusted rate in uh, five year survival. Uh, it's, it, it's studies have shown when blacks, are, uh, people of color are diagnosed with colorectal cancer at a higher rate, we ha actually have the same survival rate. But we just don't go in to get the colonoscopy, right? So important points uh, on race and colorectal outcome, more than half of blacks, white survival disparities is explained by the difference in insurance status. So if you have good insurance, more than likely, you get a letter that comes to a lot of our offices that say your patient needs a colonoscopy. You got poor insurance, you don't get that letter. One fourth is due to tumor characteristics. Uh, there's compelling evidence that uh, patients uh, receive less prompt uh, follow-up after abnormal uh, colorectal screening. Um, some patients get these colon guards and they don't get prompt follow-up and say, hey, you need a colonoscopy. So equity in race across the cancer continuum from prevention to early detection to clinical trial participation in, uh, in individualized treatment is necessary, absolutely necessary, to eliminate healthcare disparity. Um, these are some of the barriers. We have what we call patient barriers and uh, provider barriers. Patients have a fear of going to get colonoscopy, they think it's painful. Uh, historically, they mistrust information that the doctor give them, and also lack of knowledge and socioeconomic reason. A lot of, you, you find it amazing, sometimes these patients can't even afford a $5 prep. Uh, time commitment, they don't have time to go get a colonoscopy. You gotta take time off of work, you gotta pay someone to take an Uber, or pay someone to take to get a colonoscopy. All these things contribute to the disparity that we see. And then uh, barriers to screening lack of uh, recommendation, and we've seen a lot of implicit bias with studies that have shown that white, and that's what we were talking about earlier, uh, we want doctors who are culturally uh, conscious and competent, and studies that show white doctors send white patients for colonoscopy more so than white doctors send black patients. And also lack of knowledge and guidelines in the physician's office. This is one study that he pulled up, which I thought was very interesting. The 2001 looked at studies um, that showed, and this was the, traditionally the trend, the colorectal uh, incident rate uh, for black is 66.9% versus white. In Delaware, they patterned the, the ACA off the, off the Delaware Healthcare, and what they did in Delaware, they took and they gave, they made everything even. Right, so they exposed blacks to the information they supposed to at the same as white. And so when blacks was able to get colonoscopy screening compared to whites, you can see in the red that blacks received screening at 73.5% versus in whites 74.7%. Not a significant difference. But what's significant about that is the colorectal mortality rate was pretty much the same. So if you educate the people in our community to get these tests, they get the test, we reduce it, reduce the mortality rate. So PEC, the bottom line, PEC, uh, what we're doing is improving colorectal cancer screening uh, is a good first step for improving colorectal cancer outcome in African American community. Also improving access to appropriate follow-up and treatment option for the decrease in disparity and outcome in colorectal cancer. That's the first disease we're going to take up. The next one is the hyper, uh, adolescent hypertension. Normally we don't become hypertension, we become adults and start in adolescence. 
So, so the problem is elevated blood pressure during uh, adolescence is associated with cardiovascular risk in adulthood. Just a revised definition of pediatric blood pressure. I didn't know this. I'm sure a lot of you uh, uh, PCPs know this. They just did the revised um, uh, definition. What's elevated? Uh, one less than one. Well, greater than 120. Uh, systolically uh, greater than 80. Diastolically. Uh, what this is, looking at the mortality and morbidity of the new and formal guidelines and the studies have shown that African American has a 6.27% higher of, uh, of uh, elevated or central hypertension. The studies for adolescent hypertension um, was done in the Houston school and we planned to parrot that study. We find it to be accessible. And what they did down there, they provided forms to the patient, you just read it, and then they did three blood pressure, they did three blood pressure screening about one minute apart, and it was elevated, brought them in for another. Um, and with this information, then you sent it to the PCP or you sent it to uh, the clinic that the patient is going to. So we plan on pairing in the same study they did looking at hypertension and adolescents in Houston. So the bottom line initiative for PEC is intervening in adolescent hypertension can impact adult hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Given the high rate of hypertension in African American adolescent youth, reducing the rate of hypertension can impact the rate of adults in the city of Detroit and surrounding areas. So next we're going to have our treasurer, uh, Reggie Lee, uh, talking about the advocacy arm of Thanks everybody for coming again. Uh, so when we talk about advocacy, we're really talking about this organization helping others in their careers as they matriculate. Uh, and before I get there, uh, I am a member, uh, a part of a pipeline when you think about it. Uh, most of you here, I was knocking on your doors 20 years ago trying to recruit you to a hospital. From one hospital to another, then from the other hospital back to the other hospital. <laughs> right? All of you. And, but had you not helped me, I wouldn't be here today as the president of a hospital. Right? So that's a pipeline in a sense. And it's very, very important that we help each other. How do we start? We have to start with the high schoolers, middle school and high schoolers. We have to get them through college. When they get to college, medical schools. Uh, and as I mentioned here, you'll see, when you look at the HBCUs, you look at the state-sponsored schools that we have, and you look at the minority students that are trying to matriculate, are they being treated equal in getting matched to residency programs? That's a question. That's a question. I went to a residency graduation 10 years ago, a couple physicians. It was two black doctors. Everybody else was Middle Eastern Indian in the heart of Detroit. I didn't say anything. I, was at, I ate dinner, I looked at him, and my mind said something's wrong, right? But just on LinkedIn two weeks ago, I saw the, the incoming class of residents and fellows at McLaren Flint, 100% Middle Eastern Indians persuasion. Okay, we know what Flint is. We know what happens in residency. We know that you're gonna go home, some of you, some of you go to other places, some going to join faculty, some going to join private practice and stay there. But when we get back to cultural competency, how does that help us? Former governor's been indicted because of his behavior towards Flint folks. What do you think doctors that don't know anything about those patients treat those patients? Is it more about a paycheck or is it more about healing? Okay. That's very important to think about as we talk about advocacy. Uh, I put these together, I'm going to just talk because I kind of put the slide together so I know I'm talking about, right? Um, that's one of the things that's very, very important. And so when we talk about that, we want to make sure that this organization is a voice for every avenue and every position as they matriculate through healthcare and medicine, right? So when it's time for us to talk about matching a student in a residency program, particularly in urban and metropolitan areas, we need to see more color. Bottom line, we need to see more color in residency programs in urban areas. Okay? Yeah, we start with Metropolitan Detroit, 
but this should be other places too as well. It's very important. We need to see more black leaders matriculate through executive ranks. Right? See, Brother Jackson's back there. Pleasure meeting you. Right? How many black presidents are there in Detroit in hospitals? How many Detroits? How many hospitals are there in metropolitan Detroit? What is the percentage of patient population they all treat? You already know the number is. So we want to be able to say and participate in those conversations when there's some good candidates out there to say, you know what? We endorse Dr. X or Mr. or Mrs. Y. Okay, and we're going to endorse them as an organization. If we send a letter to someone and say, we really believe in this person and what they've done in this community, and here's our stamp of approval, and it's 100 doctors on that letter, you think they're going to put that, doc that letter to the side? No, they're not. And when they look at the names of those doctors, and they see that those doctors are intricate in those communities, no, they're not going to do that. So what we've done here in PEC, really, we've created a plug and play. And what did I mean by that? The same thing we did a few months ago when the city of Detroit called us and said, can you please help us vaccinate these people at these different high schools? I sent out texts to all of you. Most of you participated within 10 minutes, right? Others wanted to, but your, your obligations wouldn't allow you. That's what I mean, plug and play. We know our mission. We know what we want to do. This is not heavy lifting for you. We built this on purpose, so it won't be heavy lifting for you because we understand how busy you are. But when it's time for call to action, we want your participation. We need you to participate. And I think the ones here understand what I'm talking about, right? When we did that vaccine clinic and the guys that participated, you saw those people getting in car, getting out those cars, going to get vaccinated. It was a wonderful thing to see, right? Black and brown people. It was, very, it was a wonderful thing to see, and we contributed greatly to that. We had 20, 22 doctors do that for us. And I thank you guys for that as well. It was very, very important. So uh, I'm, we're passionate about what we're doing here. We understand what's happening. I think, uh, and we can share more of this, but as we were talking about the past two years, what's happening in this country, uh, and industry notwithstanding, we understand diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, should be a priority in everything we do. But guess what? If you're not part of that, why is it gonna be a priority to you if somebody doesn't make you do it? So we have to participate in making sure that diversity, equity, inclusion is a part of healthcare, part of these kids getting matriculated through healthcare in professions or in medicine, that's very important. I think this organization is the right organization to sponsor that, to lead that, to lead that charge. Our ask of you is really to join us in these efforts. And that's it. So when we have somebody gives, somebody gives a call last two months ago, there was this young lady in a residency program, got to Tony, and she felt there was a little bias going on. We had to do some due diligence. We tried, we decided not to pursue that, but that's what we want to do. That's the kind of things that we want to participate in, in addition to treating and teaching and training these young kids, right? We want to see, we want to make sure that if somebody's up for a position in a health system, can we help? Maybe. If we can, we want to be able to do that. What you're talking about is a gatekeeper mentality. So the one who sits at the gate determines who comes in. It was a, a, a interesting story that came on 60 Minutes. This, this was a, a story. A white general was telling that the, the company was asking why we don't have a lot of black five-star general. Now this was a white general giving this response. And the reason my ears immediately stood up is because it's the same story I heard in Alabama when my father, grandfather was explaining racial disparity and discrimination. And so the, 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 the questioner asked the general why was it a, a lot of five-star general. And he explained, when he said this, I stopped what I was doing and my attention went towards the television because he says the duck chews duck theory. And what that is, is if you have a duck who has to cross a pond and he has to choose who he's going to have follow him and he has 
a other ducks to choose, a geese, a turkey, a wolf and a fox. Who do you think he's going to choose to follow across that pond? He's going to choose all the ducks. And then the guy said, if you have generals who are choosing other generals are Caucasian, blonde hair, and blue eyes, who do you think he's going to choose? He's going to choose Caucasian, blue eyes, um, and blonde hair. So what you're talking about is what we're really all about in terms of policy making, in terms of enriching and increasing the number of African-American residents, uh, medical students, African-Americans at uh, these community hospitals. We need other ducks that looks like us in that position so when somebody like Reggie Lee comes by and wants to have a, wants to go to medical school, want to go to residency, I'm there. Who do you think I'm going to choose? We choose him. That's what we've been missing. I, I, I got you.